I'm Scott. I'm Bill. And, and we're, we're the, the Trade, Trade Guys. Guys. You're listening to The Trade Guys, a podcast produced by CSIS where we talk about trade in terms that everyone can understand. I'm H. Andrew Schwartz, and I'm here with Scott Miller and Bill Reinch, the CSIS Trade Guys. Coming up next on The Trade Guys, we'll talk about the national trade estimate President Biden's call with Xi Jinping, and we'll talk about China's foreign direct investment falling to a 30-year low, all on the next episode of The Trade Guys. Trade Guys, we're back, and so is the National Trade Estimate Report. It's out. What is the annual National Trade Estimate Report, and why has this year's report drawn so much scrutiny? Well, it's a report that Congress put into law in the Trade Act of 1974 and is required an annual report. Section 181, for you wonks out there, requires a listing. I mean, it's a long section, but basically requires a listing of trade barriers that affect uh, United States commerce. And of note, because of the way this has played out, somewhere along the line in the months of many amendments over the years, somebody added electronic commerce specifically as being covered in the report. And mostly it's one of these things that comes out, has to come out by the end of March every year. And it's mostly one of these things that comes out and the publications like Inside U.S. Trade and a few others, Politico, will do a story on it, but it doesn't usually make the big guys But this year is different because USTR announced and has been defending a different approach. And they said they were going to not list some barriers that they thought uh, were areas where it was simply a a country's exercise of its sovereign policymaking capability to undertake these things. And we did a commentary on this, which people should be able to read on the website, certainly by the week of April 5th, there's a lot of things missing from past reports. Uh, In particular, they have not been going after a lot of the digital trade barriers that they've identified previously. They didn't say have much to say about the Digital Marketing Act or the Digital Services Act in the European Union. Their references to data localization talked about only four relatively small countries. I don't think they mentioned, I'm not even sure that they mentioned China in the process. And so there's just a lot of stuff that used to be there that isn't there anymore. And I think people are upset about the pullback, particularly in the digital space, as being a change. We at CSIS also noticed that they had left out or changed their position on on import substitution policies. Import substitution policies means basically setting up barriers to exports in order to promote your own industry domestically. And this was a very popular economic theory started in the in the 50s. And a number of countries adopted it, particularly in Latin America, adopted it explicitly as their policy to try, try to promote industrial development in their countries, which otherwise would not have occurred because they'd just be buried in, in more competitive imports from developed countries. Historically, it didn't work out very well. It rarely produced the the kind of economic growth that people were hoping for, and it made products for their local consumers either unobtainable or or more expensive. So uh, over the years, most people have abandoned the policy. One of the difficulties that USDR faced this year is that we're actually now pursuing that policy in some respects. You know, the Inflation Reduction Act, as far as electric vehicles and some other things are concerned, is an import substitution policy. The CHIPS Act is an import substitution policy. It's, you know, it's policy designed to create domestic production in lieu of imports. So I think USTR decided that they were in the uncomfortable position. If they were going to condemn in other countries the same thing that we were doing, they were going to be in an uncomfortable position. On the other hand, I think the policy deserves, uh, the policy has not been a successful one. It deserves deserves some measure of criticism. So 
there's a lot of outrage, a lot of outrage, particularly from the digital people. And it was also a case of kind of selection because there were a number of other areas, environmental regulations, particularly even the DU's regulation on deforestation, where they want imports to attest that they were not growing from land that was made available through deforestation or not the product of deforestation. Those things got listed and those things got attacked, but other things did not. So uh, the principle they articulated, I think they applied inconsistently, number one. Number two, if you're, if you're, an old person like me, you were offended by their comment that what they were trying to do was simply to restore the statute to its original intent. And when I wrote about this, I I was originally going to say none of the people that worked on this report were even born in 1974. And then I discovered that Ambassador Tai was actually born six months before this bill was passed. So she probably did not contribute to it substantively at that age. But I could. I had to change my language to say that, so I ended up saying nobody was in grade school. Bill, do you have a, a vanity license plate that just says 181 on it? <laughs> no, but somebody will come up with one, no question about it. But the idea, I've, I've talked to other people of roughly my age. Nobody thinks that they're getting back to the original interpretation of, of the act. And the original, I was in Congress at the time. The original inter- purpose of the act of this provision was simple. Congress wanted to list trade barriers. And it didn't do anything else. You didn't have to do anything about the barriers. And you could even say, we're not going to do anything about the barriers. But they just wanted a list. Call it by its name. It's a barrier. And USTR seems to be stopping doing that. Well, look, the, the, the report had, had a principal use in Congress, which is it teed up oversight. Yeah, the, there was always a set of hearings where the U.S. Trade Representative would appear before the Ways and Means Committee in the House and the Finance Committee in the Senate and present their trade agenda. And this report of the listing of trade barriers was a way Congress kept tabs on on what was going on in the exe- in the executive branch. It's as if in this case, it's like you're in your last semester, you got a course you need credit for, but you didn't really focus on it. You were kind of bored with it. But it turns out, rather than going into the final exam and flunking the course, you have the opportunity to edit the exam questions and the answer key. And that seems to be what USTR did, was they said, well, we don't want to report the way it's always been done. So let's let's edit the answer key. Let's talk about the things we want to talk about. And it went over, as you might expect, in that. And in there's some glaring inconsistencies. Look, it is it is difficult to characterize Europe as a friend of the United States when it comes to trade policy. And Europe is always up to applying these crushing regulations, which make their own, makes their own industry uncompetitive, and it impoverishes their citizens. And we ought to take advantage of that <laughs> in, in, in the United States. Uh, and so you got to ask whose side, whose side you're on. But uh, I do think that the notion, what it really reveals is the degree to which that Ambassador Tai has difficulty presenting a, a negotiating agenda for for USTR. We're not we're not out creating new trade agreements. We're not modifying old ones. We're not promoting enforcement in new ways. It's like I'm not sure what what to take from that, except that it's kind of I guess I guess we want to give him some kind of letter grade, but. It's hard to say that, that there's an active program of trade agreements and trade negotiations that this national trade estimate would direct them to, to, to fulfill. So, And she'll be testifying, as usual, before Ways and Means on April 16th and Senate Finance on April 17th. And so this is going to come up. And it'll be interesting to see what she has to say. That may be something we can comment on that week. So... Ty claims that the changes represent an attempt to return to the report's statutory intent. How convincing do you find her argument? Unconvincing. 
Yeah, not at all. Look, the, the fact that there was no electronic no men's commerce here, guys. <laughs> the, the, the the fact there was no electronic commerce in in 1974 is incidental to, to the idea that that that's somehow getting back to what Congress thinks of as trade barriers and what the expectations are for the report. But there's a whole lot of of things, particularly in the environmental space, where the trade representative really needs to state a point of view. Look, the, the whole green movement requires subsidies to get it across. For tr- in tra- the trade world, subsidies have been basically prohibited to the extent they're just trade distorting for a number of years. The same with things like uh, how we evaluate safety for foods with sanitary, phytosanitary standards, the importance of risk assessment versus other uh, criteria that Europe and others seem to pile on. And the notion of that, that uh, how an item is made affects its treatment in trade is actually contrary to most of the established trade agreements that the U.S. is a party to. Uh, widgets a widget's a widget. And production and process measures are not important considerations when, when it comes to trade rules. So there's a lot to work on here. If we're going to move forward with the agenda of carbon reduction that the Biden administration wants to pursue – the trade agreements have to be conformed with that, or and the only way to do that is to negotiate. Okay. Speaking of negotiations, there was a big call between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping earlier this week. What was discussed, and was economic security an important aspect of their conversation? I think everything was discussed, as near as I can tell. It was a very long list, and it was there were security issues discussed. Taiwan was discussed. South China Sea was discussed. A lot of trade issues were discussed. Apparently, one that was not discussed was the status of the 301 tariffs, uh, which has been the subject of much speculation here about what's going to happen to them because they most of them have either technically expired or are going to expire. And there have been rumors for weeks that the USTR was about to announce something on the subject, which... Rumors have never materialized. Apparently, that didn't come up. Apparently, TikTok came up, and the president attempted to reassure President Xi that, that the U.S. goal is not is not to basically not to uh, ban it, but to divest it from their ownership and make sure the American sure, that went over well. for security reasons. Yeah, I, I think that probably didn't go over very well, but the point was made. To me, the interesting question that came up. Then I think it did come up, but it's going to come up even more today and tomorrow when Secretary Yellen is there, is the question of Chinese overcapacity. Because this is really what is creating a lot of global economic turbulence. In a country where credit is allocated by the state, you always get overinvestment, overcapacity, overproduction, and then it gets dumped on the rest of the world. So we've seen the movie in steel, aluminum, wind turbines, solar panels, It's coming up in electric vehicles. You can see that coming, I think, down the road, commercial aircraft. And one of the, I think, smart things that Secretary Yellen did when she was there last year, they set up or restart some dialogues of that with the Chinese on a variety of issues. One of them is on economics, and this is one of the main topics. And I believe that the president brought it up, and she's there to bring it up as well. And I just had a really interesting conversation shortly before this podcast with someone in the business world who follows this closely and thought that there was a fundamental divide in the way that the two sides think about China's economic problems right now. We think about oversupply, okay, overcapacity, and we want them to do something about that. They're not so worried about that. They think this is a cyclical problem for them, not a structural problem in their economy, so that they'll work their way through the cycle and everything will be all right again. We think that the best way to deal with overcapacity is for them to have more demand. This is, you know, for the economists out there, this is a demand supply equation. If you've got too much stuff, one way to deal with that is to get people to buy more stuff. And in particular, if you want to spare the rest of the world from being swamped with all these things, you get more Chinese people to buy more stuff. And I think the American view is that the Chinese are not doing nearly enough to stimulate domestic demand. 
And they tend to focus whenever they have a problem, which they do now. Their standard answer is we're going to export our way out of it. We will grow by exporting more, which exacerbates the problem, irritates more people in the rest of the world, puts more of non-Chinese companies out of business, and in the end doesn't solve their economic problems, which we think are, are structural. So that's what the debate is about. I think the president probably got into that on a higher level than what I just said. But I think Secretary Yellen is going to get into it in detail. And it'll be interesting to see how the Chinese respond. Absolutely. How do you think they will respond? Well, look, there's a lot of subtext to the U.S.-China relationship. Some of it is about the security and export controls, particularly on on the leading edge of, of semiconductors. And that, our, I think the U.S. message has been muddled there, that because we've extended incentives and subsidies and export controls well past the leading edge technologies that are, that are probably the most important to control. And so uh, the, the industrial policy that is contained in the CHIPS Act is, you know, a lot of the subsidies, but the ones to Intel, for instance, are going to generic workaday semiconductors, not leading edge components. So it's, it's hard, it's hard in the context of, of uh, China's concerns about U.S. export controls to separate what's a real national security problem and what's just a industrial policy, which China practices as well. So there's, it, that's a muddled conversation. I would also note that there's a lot of, there's a lot of de-risking discussions about U.S. China commercial policies. And uh, it looks to me like the de-risking goes both ways. That China is working on its own de-risking strategy. And there are some products and services where Chinese-made products without U.S. content is actually easier to achieve than U.S.-made products without Chinese content. Because they, you know, they started at the dirty mining and extraction end of the process and managed to get all the way to completed, say, vehicles. So there'll, there'll be a lot of mid-priced Chinese electric vehicles before there are similar cars without, made in the United States without Chinese content. So well, what, what do you guys make of China's narrative that the U.S. is holding China back from developing? I've heard it before. <laughs> yeah, a couple it's of times. Song. Yeah, this is a, Not well, new. Another verse. Not new. In, in one respect, it's true. Certainly, very clearly in semiconductors, via our export controls, we are trying to hold them back. And we would justify that by saying this is a national security issue. I mean, the Chinese reject that, but I think we are clearly are trying to hold them back. To go back to your question, I think it'll be interesting to see the Chinese response. I think uh, di- the dialogue at, at lower levels than, than the president and Secretary Yellen have sort of been a dialogue for, between economists. And economists tend to understand the problems sort of the same way. I mean, there are, there are gaps, which I'll get to. But one of the problems that both countries have is the politicians don't always listen to the economists. But when the... Uh, the American economists talk to the Chinese economists about overcapacity and, and subsidies and what they're doing. The response, I think, slowly has been to sort of recognize that this is becoming a, a global problem. It's not just a U.S.-China problem. And that other countries are beginning to gang up on them. The EU, you know, has initiated a, uh, a an investigation into electric vehicle subsidies, which I think probably this summer will end in tariffs being imposed on electric vehicles coming into Europe. So it's not just us anymore. And the conversation those then becomes so, okay, we recognize the problem. What do we do about it? And, you know, the Western response based on Western economics is you need to deregulate your economy, promote your private sector, stimulate demand, you know, promote growth through the way most countries promote growth. And this has turned out to be very hard for the Chinese economists to accept. First of all, I think, you know, they learn economics through a Marxist-Leninist lens. And so uh, the idea of deregulating and letting companies do what they want is kind of a foreign concept. But I think they're also in a position where they know that it's not a good career move in China to suggest the economy ought to be deregulated. Because basically, then you're running significantly afoul of Xi Jinping thought. 
it's not hard to read the room in China on this stuff. And I think most of the people there that, that know what to do and know what the right answer to is are not going to say it because, as I said, it wouldn't be a good career move. And instead, they support more subsidies and more exports. So I think they're going to dig the hole deeper, which is going to make the relationship more complicated and make things worse if this continues. Sticking with China for a minute, let's talk about China's foreign direct investment hits. It's a 30-year low. Basically, a collapse in foreign direct investment into mainland China has brought foreign and direct investment to a new 30-year low. Can you guys put that in perspective, what that actually means? Well, sure. This is a report. It's actually a report from China. Their, their state administration for foreign exchange, which has the lovely acronym SAFE, uh, <laughs> that's, that reports on basically the balance of payments. It's a, this is a very important report in every economy that's exposed to international trade. And the balance of payments uh, does record it has it, it is a it is a balance sheet as as many national accounts are. There is a current account uh, which also is called the trade. The current account deficit or surplus is often referred to as a trade deficit or surplus. The other side of the ledger is the capital account, and that's the the net investment position and the the flows of financial instruments for principally for the capital account. So that's what's being reported here. And when you consider investment, you have to look at, at both the, the, the total quantity was there called stocks and then the change year on year, which are the flows. So what this report indicated is that the flows were low. It doesn't account for the fact that there's still a very large stock there that has built up over the years, but flows did drop substantially below prior years and quite low in, in reference to sort of the growth years in China. There's a number of factors going on there. And because it's a very broad measure, I think it's important not to point to any one thing. But for instance, part of the, the, the capital account flows would indicate that portfolio investment is flowing out of China. That is largely because China has subsidized low interest rates, whereas interest rates are much higher in a, from other central banks elsewhere in the world. They're lower to protect the property market and to try to stimulate the economy overall, but that differential causes some outflows. Slower economic growth is part of the story here, as are lower profits by foreign firms. So repatriated profits is part of the, that capital account. So all in all, it's a, it's not a terribly gloomy picture, but it is, it is a drop. It's something to watch. And, uh, I think it reflects the overall slower growth than anticipated or slower growth in prior years in the Chinese economy. We'll see what happens. Sometimes these numbers bounce around a lot, depending on what's happening. But this is not a, not a good sign uh, from the overall health of the Chinese economy. I think it's a, I think it's a trend, not a blip. Uh, and I think it plays right into the comments we've made in the past. In fact, just earlier on this podcast on de-risking, People are finding that investing in China is a lot riskier than it used to be. And that's an economic decision because their, econo their economy is significant problems right now. But it's also a political decision. It's, it's a judgment that it's getting increasingly difficult to do business there. And one of the, an issue that, that bubbles up every once in a while, but is not recently, it's a due diligence issue that is kind of interesting. If you're contemplating an investment anywhere, one of the things you do is you try to, you do due diligence. You try to figure out if the people you're going to be investing in are reliable, if the market opportunities that you perceive are actually likely to occur, and if the people you're dealing with are criminals or not, or, you know, whether they're reliable, what their track record is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All throughout the world, there are companies that do that. You know, they investigate for a fee other companies, and they then send a report back to the potential investor saying, you know, these are good guys, these are bad guys, or here are the problems we identified, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Chinese have been waging kind of a very quiet war against those companies, and they've raided some. Bain and Company was the prominent one. They've closed some down. They've detained some of their officials. And they've also stopped providing government data, at least until recently. There's a uh, They may have changed their policy on this 
if they in the last week or so, but they've stopped making some certain data available. I mean, the big one was the youth unemployment rate, which once it hit 21%, they just stopped reporting it. But there's a lot of other data, data about what's going on in the economy, what companies are doing. Researchers have complained about that they can no longer get. And one of the consequences of that is that if investors can't get the information they need to help them make a decision, they're not going to invest. This is beginning to show up in China, I think, that, that they're beginning to experience the consequences of their policy. Their policy is, this is the Ministry of State Security, worrying about information leaking out and people in the West finding things out about what's going on in China. But in a sense, they're shooting themselves in the foot because the consequence of restricting that kind of information is people are not going to invest because they can't get the due diligence data that they need. Growing at 10% a year, those things get overlooked. When your growth rate falls to 4 or 5% a year, it's a different analysis, different judgment. Guys, I think we've about covered everything we need to cover today. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your insights. Bill, I am going down to the garage right now to find out whether it says 231 on your license plate <laughs> or 181 or what it says. I know it's got something like that. I'm not telling. You'll have to find out for yourself. <laughs> I'm on a mission. Guys, thanks so much. We'll talk again next week. You. Thanks. To our listeners, if you have a question for the Trade Guys, write us at tradeguys at csis.org. That's tradeguys at csis.org. We'll read some of your emails and have the Trade Guys react to it. You've been listening to The Trade Guys, a CSIS podcast.